The Lord be with you. Oh, let's try that again. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning to everyone who is here at Calvary and to everyone who is joining us online this morning. Uh, we have a real treat in that we have uh, the Canon Sharon Alexander with us this morning to tell us a bit more about uh, diocesan ministry here in West Tennessee. Um, if you're like me, who in, may not have grown up Episcopalian, your first question might be, what is a canon to the ordinary? And uh, Canon Sharon has promised to answer that question for us. Um, I'm learning as I go that it's, um, it's not an ordinary job. There's a lot to it. <laughs> um, Canon Shen Sharon Alexander began working as canon to the ordinary here in West Tennessee on January 1, 
2020. And if you remember the year 2020, that was a bit unusual. And uh, as she started her new job, she immediately had to jump into um, COVID measures and figuring out what that looked like in the Diocese of West Tennessee. Thanks to the assistance and goodwill of many in our diocese and community, she's learned a lot about the identity and ministries of our diocese in the greater community. Before coming to Memphis, she served as rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Baton Rouge. During that time, she led Trinity in facing the issues raised by the killing of Alton Sterling by two Baton Rouge police officers and the many demonstrations that followed. Also a record setting flood in 2016 and also changing the focus in prison ministry from working inside Angola prison to helping those who are released transition back into living into the community. In her spare time, she served as chaplain for the LSU softball team. And she says this was primarily because the coach's daughters attended school at Trinity and told their mom that the team needed prayers. So. <laughs> Canon Sharon grew up in South Texas in a small border town which means that she celebrated Mexican Independence Day on September 16 this week. <laughs> she practiced law in Dallas before going to seminary. She serves on the board of Amistad Mission, which operates an orphanage in uh, Bolivia, is the chair of the Standing Commission on Structure, Governance, Constitution, and Canons for the Episcopal Church and is entertained every evening by three cats she adopted just after she moved to Memphis. Three misbehaving two and a half year old brothers who make sure she's never bored. Let's give our warm welcome to Canon Sharon Alexander. tend to wander, so uh, I don't want to run into your mic and, and set off any problems there. Uh, I do uh, want to welcome everybody that's here, and uh, a special welcome to those who are listening to us online. Uh, if you have any questions that, that come up here in the room, we'll have time for questions uh, at the end of this. I'd like to reserve time for questions. And also, if you have any questions that you want to put in the comments as we go along. Uh, we have somebody who will be monitoring those. Uh, but uh, I do get asked a lot, what is a canon to the ordinary? And uh, there is no ordinary answer to that either. Uh, the word canon actually goes back to a Greek word, uh, which means it was a long reed that was used by merchants to measure things, to measure pieces of cloth, uh, to measure uh, small distances. And so that was a canon, and it became adopted in the Roman Empire uh, as, to mean somebody that made sure that things measured up, uh, that uh, we have the canon of our uh, books in the Bible uh, that measures up to what is considered uh, to be appropriate and, and, and authentic. Uh, so my, my job is kind of a weird job. What, what measures up? Do ministries measure up? Uh, how, how do we help them measure up better? How do uh, our policies, uh, all, all kinds of things. The, 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 most of the canons to the ordinary that I know, uh, we call ourselves the canons for everything, which means if the bishop wants something done, we're the first person they go to, and we try to make it happen. And uh, that's a little bit of, of what we're... Yes, Scott. We, we want our AV to measure up. Right? So we okay. need you to log into your computer there. It, it <laughs> yes, it, it needs the magic touch of my fingerprint to, uh, to get back. So I was asked to talk about diocesan ministry and identity. And I was fascinated by that and had to think a while uh, about how those two to go together. And uh, I, I had lots of talks with the bishop, and she had some ideas, all of which I decided were not real exciting. Uh, you, uh, well, she wanted to make sure you all knew about the baptismal covenant, and you all are Calvary. You all know about the baptismal covenant. Um, and I'd like to get a little bit beyond that. Um, Sorry, I don't that's okay. I don't like to go to sleep on us again. I, I never remember that. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I actually updated the iOS recently, uh, the, the operating system recently. Uh, tr trust me, I've got so many slides, Scott, that it's not going to be a problem. See, that, that's the way you would normally see it, but if, uh, if it doesn't have all of that stuff around the side, then Robin can't get it to the folks online, so that, that's why we don't have the prettiest pictures here. Uh, but before we get into diocesan ministry, um, what is this, this diocese? Well, we have had Bishop Phoebe since uh, back in uh, 2019, um, she came after Bishop Johnson. Uh, diocese has been around for a while. Back in 1829, all of Tennessee was one diocese, and then it got split up into three different ones, in part because the idea was, that, number one, it just took a long time to get across the state, uh, but number two, because there are different cultures in West Tennessee and the middle of the state and in the eastern part of the state. And... Um, that was important at the time. Uh, I submit that those different cultures aren't as important anymore, and we can, you can have me back to have a talk about that, but when I talk about, when I was introduced as the chair of structure, governance, constitution, and canons, that's something we've been looking at, uh, looking hard at what is the role, what is the purpose, what is the identity of a diocese, and, and I'm fascinated by, by that discussion. Uh, what do we have here? We have 29 faith communities. Very odd for a diocese to have what we have. We have 18 missions and 11 parishes, and five of those are large uh, parishes that, uh, like Calvary, that really could be, that they're bigger than some of our tiny dioceses out there, uh, that could be, and we don't want you to be, but you could be a diocese all, all to yourself uh, because of the resources and the things that you do. Uh, which makes it interesting, once again, when we get to the idea of a diocesan ministry. We also have very recently reopened a college ministry at Barth House, and I'll talk about that. And we also have our camp out at St. Columba. Uh, identity. Let's start with our bigger identity. We are part of something more than just the diocese. Uh, we are part of Province 4, which is 20 southeastern dioceses. Uh, if you've been to Canuga, and yes, we've got St. Columba, we got Camp McDowell, we got a lot of them. Uh, we got the Solomon Center back in Louisiana where I was from. Uh, but Canuga is where a lot of important meetings traditionally have happened, and now they're trying to figure out how to deal with that uh, in these COVID times where we're just not meeting together. Uh, important part of our identity that we're still trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean now? Uh, Episcopal Church. We have a ton of dioceses. We have 98 in the US. Uh, we also have 12 that are other countries like Honduras, uh, Ecuador, Taiwan, Haiti. And uh, we also have a convocation in Europe. Uh, we have lots of, of different things, so it's not just dioceses like this one. And then, of course, we are part of the Anglican Communion, which is 85 million Anglicans. Uh, we're the third largest. Uh, Roman Catholic is first, Greek Orthodox is second, and then uh, the Anglican Communion in size. But what about local identity? I told you about my three cats, or I told Heidi about them. Uh, I adopted these boys just right after I got here, January of 2020. Uh, they are inquisitive little boys. I got them when they were... Mm, they were not quite a year old, and the shelter had named them Perry, Mason, and Drake because they get themselves into lots of trouble. Uh, that's Drake. Uh, he has a superhero name. It's Fluff Boy. He gets in trouble by getting on top of the highest thing in the house and not being able to get down. Uh, that's Perry. Uh, Perry just likes to pose and be a sweet cat. And then there's Mason. Uh, he always has that guilty look because he's usually done something. Uh, you notice that Mason's name is bigger than the other two in type, uh, because that's how Mason sees the universe. Mason has an inflated identity. 
Mason thinks he's Batman. He watches Batman on TV. He's doing that right there. Uh, Mason needs to get a grip on what his real identity is, because for him, Batman flies around the house 90 miles an hour and knocks things over. And so let's just keep in mind that identity is something that we need to be thinking about really a lot. We need to pray about what is our identity. I'm trying to teach Mason that. He's a slow learner. So we can have identity. We started out talking a little bit about corporate identity. Uh, let's start here with individual identity because we talk a lot with identifiers. Identifiers like male and female, married, single, homeless. But those aren't really our identity, are they? Those identify us at a certain point in time or there's something that are not really what get to the core of who we are. We've been reading a lot in James and in Mark that talk about, you know, who do people say that I am? And I love how James talks about all of these qualities that those who follow Christ should have. Goes back, and I don't know what Paul said, because I think, Paul, you talked about a bit about Moses, but he asks God the fundamental question, who are you? And God gives this incredible existential answer, I am. I am. Well, one of the things that that means is that the other gods are not. He is, and they are not. Uh, one of the things that I have on that list of identifiers, and I want to tell just a quick story. A good friend of mine is a priest in Dallas. And about 15 years ago, she had breast cancer. And she was at a large church. Uh, actually, you all know that large church because one of your former rectors is there. It's where I used to uh, worship before I became ordained. And the church surrounded her with love and care uh, because that's what St. Michael does. But after a while, especially after she went into remission, she got tired of being the priest who had cancer. And she couldn't shake that identifier and wound up going someplace else. Because even though the people meant it out of all kinds of kindness, she wanted to be the priest that taught and that preached and that worked with children and all of those other things. But when the first thing that people would do when they introduced her was, well, this is the priest who kicked breast cancer. That was not going to be part of her identity. And she thought a lot about what should my identity be? What should I fundamentally be? And what she came up with was she's a child of God. And that if you start with child of God as your identity, you can only go good places. It gets rid of all of those other things that might be where you were at a certain place. That it's not that they're not meaningful, but it's just not who you are at your core. And it follows very much from God saying, I am. Who are we in those contexts? And it got her thinking about, OK, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, in, in Dallas, like in a lot of places in the South and other places, Christian sometimes had a, a, a weird meaning that was given to it by evangelicals or, or others. And so a lot of folks were saying, OK, call, what can we call ourselves in addition to being Christian that help? Well, it, 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 it's in the book. Jesus says, follow me. <laughs> follow me. Uh, Initially, the followers of Jesus were called the hodos, were called the way. You follow the path. So what does it mean for us on an individual level uh, to do this? And what does it mean on a diocesan level? And that's where I thought the question was really interesting. What do we do? Because we have lots of group identifiers, because that's what a diocese is. It's a group of parishes and camps and people, uh, some people who are brand new to the faith, some who aren't. And 
got lots of those. Uh, I just assume we get rid of millennial and boomer and all of that because uh, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore. And I'm from a border town and you talk to folks in Mexico about boomers and millennials, it doesn't mean a thing. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a marketing construct. <laughs> it's a, uh, so what, what, what is our identity? Well, uh, I actually took a lot more Hebrew than I did Greek, but I like to throw the Greek out there too. Uh, it's a Greek word that diocese comes from, and, and it, it actually matches up nicely with a, a canon who makes sure things measure up. It means keep house. The bishop is our housekeeper. Think about that. Doesn't mean that she sweeps a lot of stuff up. It doesn't mean she's got a big old vacuum cleaner, big old mop. But she does make sure that we keep ministries going and that we keep our ministries in what we consider a way that follows Christ. I can think of lots of ministries out there that maybe don't follow Christ so well, and I'm not saying any ministries that any of ours are doing, but I know that y'all can think of things, wow, I'm not sure what Jesus would think about that. What it means to have this diocesan identity is that we serve as a connector, as a resource. Uh, we, we don't have too many ministries that we do out of the diocesan office, uh, mostly because we only have five employees and we all got other things to do. Uh, it, your, your staff, Scott's a lot bigger than ours. Uh, and we're grateful because that means y'all can be a resource to us as well. What you all are doing here serves not just the population, but it serves the whole diocese. It has an impact far beyond your space around here. And some of those ministries that do need to be done at, at a diocesan level, what we're doing, and some of them we want to do more. Uh, we just restarted our college ministry. Hard to do that out of a parish. But when you've got several parishes working to help with it, that makes a huge difference. Uh, camp and retreat center, once again, that works better if it's at a diocesan level. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't make sense if you all had to have somebody check in with you all if you had a camp, if, at, if Holy Communion wanted to use it. Much better to have that set up at a diocesan level. Uh, recovery ministry, we, we've got two people on that. I want to shout out, I would love to see that ministry be much, much more robust. Uh, the, the studies from COVID, if nothing else, show that substance abuse has risen dramatically during COVID and there's a great need for that. And if anybody feels called to that, that is, well, it's my fingerprint again. Oh. <coughs> youth ministry, you all have an amazing youth minister here. And one of the things that uh, Gabby has been talking to the bishop about along with some of the other youth ministers is making sure we have happening and some other things. And how do we do that during COVID? Well, it, that takes more than one parish to figure that out. And that, that's where I come in to help and just make sure that our kids are safe, but they're also able to get together and do things. Uh, recovery, uh, d uh, disaster recovery, uh, absolutely best done at the diocesan level. Each church has something that it gives, uh, but I spent a lot of time last 10 years down in Louisiana, and when we had that big flood, we needed the diocese. When uh, they've just had Ida, I have been in constant contact with my good friend down there, who's the canon, uh, to say, okay, let us know when we can start sending things down there. Let us know what we can do to help, uh, because they're the ones that kind of know when it makes sense to send stuff down because I've seen people send things down that we just have to put out in the, in the dump and we don't want to do that. So diocesan coordination is, is really important. Uh, so what, 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 what does it mean? Well, I think that the point I would like to get across to you all more than anything else is that that's how we live into our identity it, as a diocese is, is through our ministry. We live into our, our, our diocesan identity through doing ministry. We actually do that. I mean, you think about our baptismal covenant. 
Uh, it's all about the ministries that we do, the ways we serve God. And we've got lots of ways, whether it is evangelism. This is from one of our tiny little churches out in the rural areas. Uh, we do it through praying, uh, through social justice, through worship. Uh, this is also something that a tiny little church is doing. Uh, Y'all do tons of ministries here. Some of our churches have fewer than 10 people that attend. And when I go to those churches, I tell them, just pick one. Pick something that y'all can do. And uh, one, one of them is getting engaged with the schools in their town. Another one is getting engaged by putting um, food out so that when people walk by that need food, they can get it. All kinds of ways, but, but it needs to be their ministry and what they think that God is calling them to do. And that's part of my job is to help them discern that. So what do we do at the diocesan level? I've told you we, we, we oversee the camp, we oversee Barth House, but we also supply, uh, supply all kinds of resources, especially for our smaller congregations. I was telling somebody that what I normally do is that I go to that do not have a priest. Uh, so I've gotten to know the rural area a lot better than I've gotten to know Memphis since I've been here. Uh, Part of my job is to recruit folks. That's absolutely a ministry, trying to recruit folks to spend time out in Ripley and Paris uh, is a challenge right now, especially with COVID. Would love to have that ministry do a little bit better. Uh, we provide uh, assistance with CPG and business. Uh, Steve calls us all the time with, okay, CPG said I need to do this and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, it, it can get Byzantine. And so we have somebody who's, uh, who has become dedicated to working with that. Uh, we have workshops. We have, uh, we're about to have a full-time communicator, which will be huge, because one of the things that I get questions all the time from, from folks, and I just don't have time to deal with it, is can you help me find a place that's doing a ministry that does X? Well, I actually usually just say call Calvary, because they're probably doing it. <laughs> but... If it's somebody that is out in LaGrange, uh, it would be nice if I could get something over, over in that area. So have, having this communications person will be huge. Uh, we oversee the ordination process. That's something that you really can't do at, at a parish level. And we have a great team. And uh, we have folks from Calvary helping with that. We do kind of the boring business work that I kind of like, which is uh, our standing committee and our we call it bishop and council. I, I often slip into executive council because I, I served on that for a long time in Louisiana, uh, which helps make the rules. We're, we're, we're working on right now something that is long overdue, which is the diocese does not have a sexual harassment policy. Uh, for me, it's a ministry to make sure that that's in place so that if that ever happens anywhere, we have a pattern for what we're, we have, we have the formula for what we're gonna do if that happens. And God willing, it won't happen. And that's sort of my thought is, let's have it in place. It's sort of like carrying the umbrella so it doesn't rain. Same concept there. And then uh, Scott and Steve Smith will be joining us in 2022, we think, COVID permitting, in Baltimore for, for general convention. So we, at the diocesan level, we, we coordinate and connect at those things, but we don't get into the, the nitty gritty of, of what we do our beautiful camp. We do take care of that. Interfaith, uh, that's, that's huge for me. We would not have recovered from the flood in Baton Rouge if it weren't for all of the different churches working together. And I am thrilled, but I would actually like to see even more uh, interfaith work with, with MIFA and, and other groups. Uh, they can make such a difference. Uh, this is the, the bishop and, and several uh, doing uh, doing some service work last Thanksgiving is what that's a, a photo of. Uh, youth events, uh, y'all recognize who's, who's speaking there. She's one of the best. Uh, and uh, it's just been hard to figure out what to do during COVID. And I give our young youth coordinators all kinds of credit for figuring out how to do things. Uh, this has made a big difference with mental health you do it on the parish level, but it makes it so much more powerful when you can get them all together for happening and for other events. And that's at the diocesan level. 
Uh, that's one of them. Uh, you can see a bunch of Calvary kids, or you could if we could blow it up a little bit more in there. Barth House, that has been a tremendous start. And that, that is, yes, a diocesan ministry, but so many of our parishes have been part of making that happen. Once again, we were a coordinator. The, this is their first evening where, where they had dinner. And I can't remember how many people it is, but it was three times what they expected and they ran out of food. And uh, that, that won't happen again. But one of the things that they are asking for is for individuals or churches to provide dinners on Sunday evenings. And so if y'all are looking for something extra to do, uh, put, put that on your list. I've, uh, you've got handouts on how to get connected with, with Barth House, and that would be something that would be huge to help with. Uh, once again, they, they just had to scatter people out all over the place. It was such a success. The other thing that it does is uh, we're, we're looking at, and the bishop told me to be careful with how I say this, creative liturgies. We're following the Book of Common Prayer. We're following everything. But when was the last time you saw six women at the altar? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we were able to do that at Barth House because we could pull in the four women who had just been ordained deacons. Uh, it was actually Miranda Cully's idea uh, to, to be able to do this. It, people said this was like nothing they had seen before on different levels. It was a right to prayer be service. Uh, but we had video, we, we had all kinds of, of people involved. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was on Ma Mary Magdalene's feast day, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Mary Mag was happy with, with what she saw on that. Uh, because once again, it was all about engagement. And what does it mean to, to, to be a follower just like Mary was? Thistle and B, you all have been involved with this for a long time. Uh, it is also considered one of our official diocesan ministries uh, based off of one that I was very, very familiar with in Nashville. Uh, founded by Becca Stevens, and thank goodness we've got these all over the place. I was actually involved with the one called Hope House down in, in, in Baton Rouge as well. Uh, these are the kind of ministries we need that just change people's lives and give them not just hope, but job skills. Give them community. And so uh, would love to see e even more of that uh, shameless plug for their products. You can find that online. Uh, that's an easy way to help them. We also recognize as a diocesan ministry, and nobody actually knows the history on this, uh, the Haiti Partnership that is mostly run out of the cathedral. But once again, it is something that is really important to us because it reaches out to the Anglican Communion. It goes beyond Memphis. And you might know that there was an earthquake there a month ago. And if you're interested in helping with this, Dr. Susan Nelson and uh, Drew Woodruff are very involved in this. And so we have, I'm just showing you just real briefly some of the things that we do. We, we also get to do some creative stuff. Uh, our uh, communications minister came to the bishop early on and said, hey, there's a time slot at WYXR. Would you like to do a show? And that's how Faithfully Memphis came about. And uh, once again, uh, I'm shamelessly promoting your, your youth here, but I just think that that's so important. We, we had a session that was on youth ministry that was uh, moderated. Uh, the, the questions came from, from Carter and Gabby, and it's one of the best we've ever done. Uh, Paul just did one that I haven't had a chance to hear. Can't wait to hear it. Uh, but I am hearing great things with Bill, with, with Bill exactly. Uh, which, which, which just means that, that we get to do all kinds of wonderful things that uh, I don't know of any other diocese that's doing something like that, but it's become part of our identity. There are folks that I run into every once in a while, and when they figure out where I'm working, they say, I think I've heard about your radio show. And, and it's so nice to hear just normal people uh, talk about their faith, uh, Kanji Anthony, people that, that are recognizable in the community. Um, I don't know that we're getting a whole lot of traction from that, but as we 
go on, I hope we get more and more because people are telling some incredible stories. So if you want to have more information, um, I did get some, um, some handouts from St. Columba and from Barth House. Uh, I can get more, but really the best way to get information is not to call the diocesan office, uh, even though you can do that, but it's just going to take a while. But uh, on our website, we have a, a page that will connect you with, the with some of the different things. The better way to do it is to make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter. Uh, it comes out on Wednesday or thir well, usually Thursdays now. And we are trying, and y'all are doing a great job of getting stuff to us, uh, but we want to publish what the different places are doing. Once again, that's our role as a connector, our role as support, is there may be people at Grace St. Luke's and St. John's or up in Millington that are interested in something that y'all are doing. And we want to make sure that we put that out there. I know you've got some musical events that folks would love to come and see. And so that is part of that diocesan uh, housekeeping that diocesan, making sure that everybody knows all of the things we do, because one of the things that's important for what we call diocesan vitality or parish vitality is that we are actually doing things that bring people closer to Christ. And things that might bring my brother closer to Christ, I can tell you, are very different from the things that bring me closer to Christ. Uh, Y'all had Amber here who poetry brought her close to Christ, and she could share that in a way. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good at poetry, but I'm pretty good at getting out there in the middle of a place that's been devastated by a, a, a hurricane and getting people to actually be able to figure out what to do. All of these are different ways of bringing people closer, and I think that's so important. So uh, you can start with what we have there. Uh, I, will, I don't know whether I sent you a PDF of the slides, but I would be happy to send you a PDF so that folks can, can get that from you easily. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, Barth House, you probably already signed up. You probably already signed up several times, but offer to provide a meal on Sundays uh, one thing that y'all are doing that's, that I think is so important, because there's just times during the day when there's nobody in there, is that you're having meetings. Uh, y'all had a vestry retreat, I think, there, didn't you, Scott? Uh, that's huge. We want that kind of connection. We want people to go over and see what, what's going on. Uh, and it's okay that there are some students in there in some of the other rooms at the same time, because they get to see that the church is alive that the church is people who care meeting. Uh, the diocesan communicators meet once a month on uh, Wednesdays after, and they stick around and, and they say hi to the kids. I think that's, our, they're not kids, they are, uh, they are young adults who are college students. Uh, they look like kids to me. St. Columba, uh, people ask about St. Columba. Uh, it took a hit, it took a big hit during COVID. They were able to do a smaller, a, a smaller mud camp this year, which was great. Uh, it would have been nice to be able to serve more kids, but they served what they could safely. And it was such a shot in the arm for the people that work there to be able to interact with the kids and for some of our uh, clergy and our volunteers to go out there and be part of something and say, you know what? COVID may be bad, but it's not winning. We can still do this kind of ministry. Uh, it's caused us to be very creative, and I'm really pleased at how creative they have been able to be out, out at, at St. Columbia. You may remember at the very beginning of COVID, one of the things they did was uh, they made meals that you could gum and pick up, uh, number one, because it was hard to go to grocery stores, and number two, it helped them get some money. Uh, these are all ways of engaging in ministry. All ways of following Jesus. Thistle and bee, um, I'd like to see that be four or five times the size. They, 
uh, I've, I've got good friends in the DA's office, uh, and the number of trafficked people in, in Memphis is huge. Uh, that, that is a, a ministry that will never have enough people. Uh, in fact, I, I actually, be, be, because of a number of connections, have, have been invited to be part of a, a roundtable to, to talk about how do we deal with victims in these situations. Uh, learned a lot working at Hope House. And uh, Bill, you'll, you'll be interested to know that the first question that these women asked me was, how do I know what my identity is? How do I know who I am? Because I have been in this situation where I didn't get to make any decisions about what I ate or when I ate or anything else. And other female priests that have worked with trafficked women say that is a fundamental question. What is my identity? And for me, that's just gold that I get to talk to them about, well, the first thing you are is you are a beloved child of God. And that's partly why I didn't want to go through, through the, the baptismal covenant today. Uh, Y'all got plenty of people who can do that because most of these women aren't baptized. But I can get them moved into, you can have this relationship no matter what you have done or even worse, what has been done to you. Uh, if, 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 you know what, we don't need that anymore. <laughs> uh, if you want to get into identity ministry, uh, not everybody can just show up and say, hey, I want to talk with the women and do things, but there are people who have a gift for that. And uh, I can, uh, I, th that's one where I would be happy to talk to folks about how to discern how to do that, because that is a ministry. Uh, and, and if you want to know, partly why I'm so passionate about this is that we had Hope House in Baton Rouge, and it got destroyed by our flood. And trying to get that rebuilt, uh, well, it's actually still not rebuilt, and the flood was in 2016. Uh, but that, that was, Jesus was there in those ministries. Uh, once again, though, hard for a parish to do that, but when you're doing it from a diocesan level, uh, you can bring in those resources that make sense to do that. Um, we are at 15 minutes, and what I'd like to do now is open this up for questions. For those of you who are listening to this online, it, uh, in fact, if there are any questions that we've got from the people online uh, that, are in, that have put questions in the comments, we've got somebody monitoring that. i uh, like to take any of those that we've got first and then uh, open it up to any of y'all. And uh, it, it really can be kind of tangential. I, I, I've covered a broad range of things. Uh, that, was, that was intentional. And if you want to, to focus in on anything I talked about, I uh, would love to do that. And just also want to say how grateful we are at the diocesan office uh, for what Calvary has been doing. Uh, honestly, long before Scott got here, but you have continued an amazing, uh, y'all do ministry, uh, and y'all do it well, and that makes it easy for us in the diocese to say, we, we, we can't do that, but we know the folks at Calvary who do. Well, I got a question. Yes, Scott. Um, so you gave a picture of how just t Tennessee in our history became three dioceses. Right. Uh, I wonder if you look ahead forward. So there aren't many institutions that look like they did even 20, 30, 40 years ago, much less five centuries ago. So when I think about what's a diocese for, what's a diocese for looking forward? Do you, what changes do you see in just how they function? Any Ooh, thoughts I could, on that? Oh, I could, I could talk for a long time on that. Thanks, Scott. I had the pleasure of serving on the task force on the episcopacy for the Episcopal Church. And that's actually how I met Bishop Johnson because he he was on that uh, for a while. Uh, yes, a, a, a diocese used to be, I mean, you know, historically, it was that small housekeeping oversight. Uh, it, it really wasn't even so much about ordination. That was, that was part of it, but that, that really didn't even become so important. It, it, it was more like, okay, we're throwing lots, and, and here, here's Matthew, we're going to do him. It, it, it now is obviously a lot more complicated. We, uh, and I'm just going to put this out there, this is not news to anybody, 
We don't need 98 dioceses. Roman Catholics have fewer than that, and they have far more people. Uh, I can't remember what the Lutherans have, but I think it's around 10 synods. Methodists have far fewer. Uh, that, that, that's a huge issue, and, and the reason I bring that up is because your question is tied to another question, which is, what's the role and purpose of a bishop? And if the role and purpose of a bishop is that old purpose of they go out to the small diocese, because the, our initial dioceses were very small, and they, they get to know the people, uh, that's one thing. But that's not what bishops do now. Uh, unfortunately, that's why a lot of them get elected. It's like, oh, that's the one that I would like to go to dinner with and, and have come uh, talk to us and, and be here with us. But even in a small diocese like this one with, with 28 faith communities, that still means the bishop only gets to visit each one uh, probably once a year. Uh, they, there, there are things that she does at the cathedral where she gets to, to do that a, a little more often. Uh, but bishops also have to go to House of Bishops meetings and, and all kinds of things. It just doesn't even look like it did 20 years ago. Uh, bishops travel a lot more, uh, and, and this has all been upended by COVID, but what do I see? And this is Sharon Alexander talking. This is not Bishop Phoebe talking, but she's not going to disagree with me, I don't think. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to partner with other dioceses. Uh, you may know Bishop Sean Rowe in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, he spent a number of years negotiating Okay, the lawyer just slipped out there, talking with the folks in Western New York about how they should partner together. And they're doing that now, and it's making a difference. Uh, but you do have to think about what is, do, do, do we really need three canons to the ordinary in Memphis and Nashville and Knoxville? No, we don't. We would be far better off if we had a canon for mission and the canon that does uh, ordination process and, and, and things like that, and maybe another one that does administration uh, would be a far better use of our uh, assessment to the diocese. Uh, those talks are really coming into uh, importance right now thanks to COVID. Uh, that, that really shook up the House of Bishops a lot because there was no connector up at the denominational level, and, and there weren't at any of them because nobody had been through a panic, a pandemic like this, uh, as, as to how they, they could make their decisions and structure their decisions. It, it was really all kind of left at the diocesan level. And it kind of opened up our eyes about, okay, how do we do this? And every diocese was doing it differently. So the answer to your question, Scott, is it's evolving. Uh, we know it has to evolve. We know that as it is right now, uh, it, I laugh about being the canon for everything, but the reality is, is that I'm doing things that are absolutely in my wheelhouse, and then other things that are actually in somebody else's wheelhouse, and it would be really nice if we had somebody that has a passion for, uh, actually I got rid of this part of it, but, but a passion for dealing with HR, so that we could, we, we could Ha have that just taken care of, where with me, that's an annoyance. Uh, put me in the disasters, put me out there with the, uh, I'm, I'm from rural South Texas, Edinburgh, Texas, sounds small, it is. Uh, I know what small churches look like, even though I've spent most of my time in bigger ones. Uh, that's another really important thing, Scott. What is a diocese gonna do with small churches that are not vital and are not viable. Uh, we don't want to just go in and shut them down. Because uh, that's hard, that's their home, that's their spiritual connection. Uh, so what, what are dioceses going to do? What, what are we going to look like? I don't know. But I know what we need to be looking like now, and I would love to be in conversation with people like y'all as to what your vision for the role of the parish and how that might work with, with the diocese. Uh, I have lots of ideas, but it's got to, it, 
it's not going to work if it doesn't come up from the bottom because that's where ministry is done. It's, it's not done by organizations, it's done by people. And I think anything that doesn't take into account what furthers ministry, what, for, what furthers us following Jesus, that is, uh, that, that's where it's got to be. Thank you. I love that question. I'll come back and talk more about that if you want. Yeah, Bill. A mile and a half from here east is the seat of the diocese. Yep. The cathedral. Yep. What are the plans for the cathedral? It's a mission now, right? It, 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 it is a mission. Uh, the, and it is a mission by, by definition in our, uh, in our canons. Uh, they have not been able to pay their, their assessment for a while. Uh, they got hit with COVID at the worst time in, in a transition. And where they are right now is they have an amazing uh, Lutheran, and this is why I keep on talking about reaching out beyond our, our, our borders, uh, Lutheran interim who knows what she's doing and who has helped bring transparency to their finances and who is putting a plan in place for the work that, uh, there's some severe maintenance work that has just not happened for a, for a long time that has got to be done there, and she's got a plan for that. Um, she's, she, she's got lay people that are actually really involved in the discussions, and I'm not disparaging anybody, that, anything that was happening there before. It was just a different time. Uh, but when, when you have a transition and, and you have COVID, boy, that's hard. That's just really, really hard. Uh, what, what we need, uh, they, 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 they are doing things such as having uh, youth events where, where they would like to have it be collaborative. And people like Gabby are saying, yes, they can't all be there, but we can do some things there. Uh, things where people get to touch their ministries uh, make a difference. And um, I have great hope for what that can be. But as I was telling Scott, a diocese may not quite look like a diocese before, we are rethinking what is a cathedral in 2021 and going forward, especially given COVID. Um, and there are some really good people. There's a cathedral committee that's made up of people outside of, of the cathedral and inside looking at that. Um, what, what, I, what I would say is they need your prayers. They need hope. Uh, they have hope. Uh, they, they know who they're following. Uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. But, but watch the progress over time. Hi, I wanted to share a couple of comments from sure. online viewers. First from Zeta Gates, mm -hmm. and she says, I appreciate hearing about all the opportunities not only my parish offers, but the diocese offers these endless, endless possibilities to discover what our identities are. So many of us know we are on this road, but it sometimes takes time to identify our gifts. When we are aware, it opens us up. So that's from Zeta. And Wendy Bailey says, I was shocked at how small this diocese is after being in Arizona and especially Massachusetts. Did you have something that you, you can give us a, a sense of scale or comparison? Abs absolutely. Uh, ask the chair of structure, governance, constitution, and canons that one. Uh, where we are is, uh, Diocese of Texas is by far the largest in size, wealth, and, and everything else. Uh, I believe it is the Diocese of Western Kansas that's, that's at the bottom. Uh, they, 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 uh, they barely have a thousand members. Where we are is the, the top of the bottom third. There, there are a lot of dioceses. Uh, Louisiana, East Tennessee are kind of at the top of, of, of the bottom third, at, at, and we, we're, we're, we're there, uh, you know, go, go up a third, and, the, and, the, and that's us from the smallest. So we, we are, are by no means the smallest, but we are, uh, we, we are in a position where it would make a lot of sense for us to be partnering with our churches 
and with other dioceses to, to get things done, like HR is, is just one that's a, an obvious one, uh, that uh, we, we really need people to help, uh, not so much churches like this, but, but our smaller churches, but y'all have had some interesting qu questions like that. We do have a lawyer that, that does that, but uh, that's a volunteer, and, and we need somebody that's a little more engaged. That's a, a, a real, just an easy, easy one. Uh, but really, why, why do we need to be doing certain things where we're just replicating what the middle of the state does in the eastern part of the state? Or we can look over to Arkansas or, or down to Mississippi. Um, s same issues there. Uh, so yes, we, the, the other thing, just real quickly, that we do have that a lot of dioceses our size don't have is that we have an endowment. Now, it's restricted to re really two things. Uh, what it's mostly restricted to is things that, that involve youth and young people. So that means we, we don't have a whole lot of flexibility in what we were doing, but I can tell you our youth and young folks need a lot. And, and so I'm glad if it's restricted to anything, that's where our restriction is. Uh, another question? Um, so a follow-up comment from Wendy Bailey says, I worked with the congregational consultants in the Diocese of Massachusetts. It was a group of laity that went into predominantly small churches and helped with everything from finances to conflict res resolution. It also included looking at the matrix of vibrant and or viable churches. And sometimes that meant helping churches through a hospice process. Um, I have one question as well, just of my sure. own, and then I think we're just about at time here, sure. but I'm guessing that this may be the first time in our diocese that we are led by a female bishop and a female canon. Yep. And I loved seeing the picture of the, the women around the altar there. Um, I wondered if you had anything to say about this time and the role of women in leadership. Are you seeing any trends, any movements, um, anything that you're noticing? A absolutely. Uh, if you look at the newer bishops that are getting elected, far more female bishops th than ever before. And uh, not that there's a problem with the guys, but, but having a diversity of opinions, especially in a time of change and a time where we really need to be looking at new things, it's great to have different perspectives in there, uh, perspectives of, of people of color, perspectives of, of women, uh, that really helps with the creativity process. And it also helps address, okay, what is this group that we would like to have more engaged, but they just don't have the resources, they're working two jobs, uh, how, how, can, how can we do that? Uh, go, going back to uh, what uh, Massachusetts, I'm very familiar with, with what they did there. That's one way to get lots of different people engaged, and uh, you're gonna hear that from both the Bishop Phoebe and me, is that we're all called to follow Jesus, and figuring out what that is, what that part of our identity, our personal identity, what, what, what do I feel called to, what, what do other folks feel called? And sometimes it's just not finding your personal ministry. It's like, you know what, I feel called to be doing this, but there's this great need and I can help there anyway. Uh, women foster a lot of that. Uh, we, we, if nothing else, it makes people, it, 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 it shifts. One of the reasons I put that up there, people haven't seen that before. It helps just shift your perspective a little bit. Um, it, Bishop Phoebe comes from uh, one kind of a Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, I, I can't tell you, but she's got a book that tells you what it's like to grow up black there. Uh, I can tell you what it's like to grow up in a, a little tiny border town in, in South Texas. It has absolutely shaped how I see things. Uh, Really, the, the answer to your question is, is, is that I think we're gonna need, I know we're gonna need greater involvement, and if we have greater involvement, especially from women and people who typically haven't been at the table, that's gonna make all the difference. Thank you so much oh, my for, your, for spending time with us, uh, for letting us know a little bit more about who you are, your identity, and also our collective identity. Let's give a hand to Canon Sharon Alexander. Thank you all. Thank you all.